This video is on formal abstraction and its relationship to abstract labour. I'm doing this at the request of a viewer who said it would be useful to have a video on this and it's turned out to be slightly harder to prepare than I expected. I'm going to be dealing with the origin of the idea of abstract labour, talk about what is abstraction, then I'll talk about metric spaces and I'll talk about the properties of labour. Not necessarily in that order though. Just as a warning, this talk involves relatively advanced theory. Uh, a bit of maths in it. So I'm just giving a wee warning at the beginning. Starting off with Adam Smith, he says labour was the first price, the original purchase money that was paid for all things. But he, he also says that most people understand better what is meant by a quantity of a particular commodity than what is meant by a quantity of labour. One is a palpable object, the other an abstract notion, which, though it can be made intelligible enough, is not as natural or as obvious. Now Marx says, the equalization of the most different kinds of labour can only be the result of an abstraction from their inequalities or of reducing them to a, their common denominator, viz. the expenditure of human labour power or human labour in the abstract. With regard to what forms the groundwork for the quantitative determination of value, namely the duration of that expenditure, or the quantity of labour, it's quite clear that there is a palpable difference between its quantity and quality. In all states of society, the labour time that it costs to produce the means of subsistence must necessarily be an object of interest to mankind, though not of equal interest in different stages of development. And lastly, from the moment when men in any way began to work for one another, their labour assumes a social form. Now, Smith is talking about quantity of labour being an abstract notion, and he distinguishes between the unqualified labour, by which he means labour in the abstract, and variety, what he calls varieties of labour, or sorts or kinds of work, by which he means particular trades or professions, um, farming, spinning, etc. Marx's terms are, are analogous, though not identical. Um, he talks about labour in abstraction from its inequalities. He talks about it being measured in terms of quantity and duration. And he also, like Smith, talks about various kinds of labour, qualities of labour, or concrete sorts of labour. This sometimes gets elided when people talk about Marx. They only think he mentions the pair of words concrete versus abstract. For as actually, like Smith, he uses a variety of terms to refer to different kinds or sorts of work. And it's no surprise that the same ideas are occurring in these two great economists because um, Smith was closely studied by Marx and um, was very familiar with what Smith wrote. So what is abstraction, which both of them are, are calling upon here to discuss labour? The basic idea in abstraction is that you ignore differences between things to focus on what they have in common. So you can ignore the difference between the colours of the balls on the slope there and just focus on the fact that they're all balls. And in maths we use abstraction a lot, same in programming. You, you have abstract operations of addition and multiplication, whether that's over numbers, matrices, polynomials, etc. And 
you can talk about sets in the abstract, as abstracting from whether they're sets of numbers, sets of names, etc. But focusing only on the common properties of sets like union, intersection, etc. Now let's take another field in biology. The abstract concept that's widely applied there is that of a species. And when you refer to a species, you're abstracting from the concrete differences between individuals of the species. In the cases of the species dog, you abstract from the difference between breeds of dogs. You treat them all under the ca abstract category dog. The question is, is this something real or is it just a convention? Are these abstract categories that we deal with things just invented by humans or do they exist in the real world? Well, the abstraction dog is a real abstraction because all breeds of dog can mate and produce fertile offspring. Whereas we know dogs can't produce fertile offspring by mating with sheep or cats or rabbits. On the other hand, if one talks about the name of a, a dog breed, like Springer Spaniel, that's just a conventional abstraction. It's just convention whether we term a dog a Springer or a Cocker Spaniel and they shade over into one another. I mean, when we say it's a convention, it's a convention that's partially established by organisations that set conventions, like the convention, the Kennel Club. But it's not a real abstraction, because as far as dogs are concerned, a Springer Spaniel and any other dog is just a dog, and they'll produce fertile offspring with any dog breed. So it's, it's a purely human convention in that case. Now, what about abstraction and work? What about this notion of abstract category of work? In How the World Works, I use a very similar illustration to this to point out that in termite communes, there's no abstract labour. There are other societies on this planet, not just human society, and among the insect societies, Typically, there are multiple body forms. Uh, in, among termites, for example, a soldier termite can't build nests, a worker termite can't defend a nest, and only allates can reproduce. So there's a division of labour, but it's a division of labour brought about by physical difference between the individuals of the species. In this sense, there isn't really abstract labour power in a termite uh, commune. On the other hand, humans do have abstract potential. Why is that? It's because we're flexible. We know that most children with the right education can move into every, any profession. We're not saying every child can. There are some... Um, children with learning difficulties, obviously. But the great majority can be directed into different professions with the right education. And we know that people can shift between trades in our own lifetime. This abstraction is actually blocked in some societies. If you think of a traditional caste society, labour abstraction is almost totally blocked. People can't move between trades because children are forced to follow the trade of their parents, their caste. And in class society, uh, abstraction is limited or partially blocked. For example, in the United States, it's very hard for the child of manual workers to train as a surgeon. Now, this has consequences. It has a consequence that the price of medical treatment is above its value in the USA. Medical treatment is very expensive because the labour of uh, surgeons and other medical professionals is not abstract. It's, it's partially a caste labour. 
And it's only under socialism that labor really becomes abstract. Only socialist societies allow the abstract potential of people to be fulfilled. You can realize this by contrasting a relatively poor country like Cuba, where the opportunities to train as a doctor are far greater than they are in the USA. And this has consequences for health in Cuba, that uh, infant mortality figures are lower in Cuba than the USA, despite the US being a richer country. It's because class barriers to education and training were removed. But abstraction isn't just a matter of talking about labour. It's not just a matter of biology. It's used in other sciences. And I'm going to focus on the similarity between concepts of abstraction that were developed in physics and the concepts Marx uses. So I'm starting with a series of um, materialist thinkers. Uh, Lucretius, who formulated the materialist principle underlying conservation laws. Nihi ex nihilo fit, nothing comes from nothing. And Marx cites this in justification for the law of value in a footnote in Capital. Then you have Newton, who extends it to conservation of momentum. No, uh, momentum can't come from nothing. The, the, to each action is an equal and opposite reaction. I could have put in Archimedes as well, but Archimedes also develops forms of conservation law. Going on from, Newton realised that momentum was conserved, but he didn't have a concept of energy. And the discovery of the concept of energy is due to Du Châtelet, who was the translator of Newton into French. And we'll see that in order to uncover the concept of energy, she required to use, it required her to use very strong levels of abstraction. Similar forms of abstraction to those that Marx uses in Capital where he applies the conservation principle to commodity exchange and logically deduces that value is conserved in exchanges. And use, he does this using what is essentially the same logical process as was used in mechanics to deduce that energy existed. He deduces that value as abstract labour exists using the same form of argument that was used to prove the existence of energy. I'm going to do this by examples taken from ballistics. A big impetus for the early development of mechanics or classical mechanics came from the requirement that kings had to have accurate cannons. To do that they need to understand ballistic trajectories. Let's look at this. This is an old mortar, a type of short cannon that fired mainly upwards to fire over castle walls was basically its purpose. And I'm taking that because it's easier to deal with upward trajectories. So let's suppose we have a mortar that fires a cannonball upwards at 98 metres per second. Obviously I've chosen that to be a nice round number. After one second, its velocity will have fallen to just over 88 metres a second. And if you average the speed it was travelling in the first second, you'll find that the average speed was 91 metres per second and it therefore must have risen 93 metres in the first second. Next second, it slows down to 78 metres per second, an average speed of about 83 metres per second, and that means that after the second second, the cannonball is at the height of 176 metres. 
This goes on with the cannonball slowing down as it goes up and it reaches a maximum height of 490 meters. It's easy to construct such tables, provided you knew the velocity that the cannonball left. In, in practice, the techniques that they had back in the 17th and 18th century to measure the velocity of cannonballs would be relatively primitive. Suppose, though, that you worked out how high it was going to go at a set of different velocities, 19 meters per second, 39 meters a second, 49, etc. You can get a table of how high it would go, and I've prepared the table. It doesn't tell you much, but if you look at it as a graph, you can see how the height varied with velocity. Velocity along the bottom, the height it gets to, shown here. And the interesting thing about it is that the height it gets rises very steeply the faster the cannonball's going. It rises non-linearly. You can see that it's non-linear by taking that previous graph and plotting it on a log-log scale. Now, once I've plotted it on a log-log scale, we get a straight line. 19 meters high, 39 meters, 49, 66, 98. These are the, sorry, these are the starting velocities and heights. 39 meters per second gets 78 meters high. 49 meters per second, 122. These ones I can't read, they've gone off the edge. But the important point is a straight line. If you look at the slope, it's a straight line of slope of slope 2, which means that what's involved is a power law that the height varies as v squared. And this was the first clue as to what energy might be. We have something here that depends on the square of velocity. Now you'll all have learned at school that kinetic energy is half mv squared. But you, I'm trying to reconstruct how this was realized. Now, if you plot the trajectory of a cannonball, it follows a parabola, and you can see parabolic path hit, hitting its maximum height there, and the vertical climb slowing down to nothing after 10 seconds. That's not very informative. We have one slope downwards and a para parabola going up. But let's look at it in a different way. Let's try squaring the velocity. Or rather, square it and halve it. And what we get is an exact replica of the climb in height except mirror imaged. We get two curves that are mirror images of one another. If they're mirror images of one another, they sum to a constant. So something is being conserved in the upward path of the cannonball. What Chatelet did was a striking example of the power of abstraction. From two apparently quite different things, height and velocity, she arrives at a unitary concept. In fact, she's not just doing it for cannonballs, she's considering planetary dynamics as well, which is the more general case. And to do this, she had not only to abstract from the difference between height and velocity, she had to transform one of them, the velocity, by squaring it. And by doing this, she discovers a hitherto unknown substance, energy. Energy had been discovered by the power of abstraction. Now, before going on to show that it's an exactly analogous process that Marx uses in Capital, I'm going to use some other diagrams to help you understand how conservative systems, that's to say systems governed by conservation laws, behave. Sometimes it's easier to see things 
than to reason about them purely algebraically. In the discussion so far, I've only considered one component of the motion of the cannonball, its vertical component. But we know that bodies can move in three dimensions. And a cannonball's trajectory always has at least two dimensions, a vertical and horizontal one, if we ignore winds going across the trajectory. And if we consider these separately, we have to move from talking about pure numbers to thinking about vectors. And be patient about this. I'll explain why vectors and conservation are relevant to Marx's theories shortly. But these are key ideas. Now I have a rather complicated plot about the trajectory of a, a cannonball. Consider the red rays coming out here. These are possible angles you could fire your cannon at. At each of these angles I've placed a blue dot on a circle. And those blue dots mark the vertical and horizontal components of the cannonball's velocity. So that if I have an angle of zero degrees, the entire velocity of one is horizontal. If I have an angle of 90 degrees, the entire velocity of one is vertical. And in between, there's various combinations nations, which you can read off vertically and horizontally. Note, I'm assuming that the cannonball leaves at the same speed, whatever the angle, and I'm just calling that speed 1. Now, the green line is a plot of the vertical and horizontal energy components. That's obtained by squaring the vertical and horizontal speeds. Squaring and dividing by two, etc. And the lines, the grey lines, show how a given combination of vertical and horizontal velocities is mapped onto a combination of vertical and horizontal energies. We know that the two must be independent of one another because Marx had, sorry, not Marx, Newton had already demonstrated that you can treat velocity components separately in dealing with the laws of motion. And we're left with this triangle here, the, tr the area bounded by the triangle here is the indicator of the fact we have a conservation law. Because the hypotenuse of this triangle describes all points where the sum of the height and the horizontal distance sum up to the same sum up to one, same sum up to the same amount. And if you're dealing with something that has a conserv scalar conservation law, a two-dimensional system with a scalar conservation law, you can plot such a diagram. There are two dimensions to our possible abstract space, vertical and horizontal energy. But because energy is conserved, all possible permitted positions must occur along a single line. There's only one degree of freedom of the system. Now, obviously, I could have said I've got a cannon that can track as well as elevate, in which case the possible um, energy components of the cannonball would be in three dimensions. And instead of a line corresponding to the 
positions where the sum of energies added up to the same, there would be a plane. The energy components would have formed a plane in three dimensions. Now we get on to Marx. Let's look at the value equations Marx gives in capital, where he says the expanded relative value form is, however, nothing but the sum of elementary relative ex expressions or equations of the first kind, such as 20 yards of linen equals one coat, 20 yards of linen equals 10 pounds of tea. Each of these implies the corresponding inverted equation, like one coat equals 20 yards of linen, 10 pounds of tea equals 20 yards of linen. So he's explicitly laying out the properties of value in terms of a series of equations. Now, why is he doing this? Well, what is he doing here? He's actually setting out something like the previous diagram, except here it's not velocity, it's not energies. I have a T axis, a linen axis, and a coat axis. He's saying 20 yards of linen equals one coat. That defines a line there between them. 20 yards of linen equals 10 pounds of T. And by inference, 10 pounds of T equals one coat. And more generally, any position on this plane defines a combination of holdings of commodities that is of equal value. Value is conserved as you move around this plane. That's what's implied mathematically by these equations. It's not obvious if you just see the equations written down. It becomes clearer when you do a geometrical drawing for it. Marx is explicitly constructing the equations for a plane in three dimensions. And with his, his etc., he's generalizing this to n-dimensional vector spaces. And this is exactly what you need if you're going to demonstrate the conservation of a hidden scalar property. It's actually formally the same as the process by which we deduce that energy exists and is conserved in mechanics. So he's deducing that value as distinct from exchange value, exists and is made apparent by the exchange relations because it is value that is being conserved in the relationship. And since he says there is nothing physical that is being conserved in this relationship, the weights, mass, differ chemical compositions differ. The only thing that can be this substance value is the labour that went into making them. So, Du Châtelet had an abstract concept of energy and she arrives at the concept of energy by abstraction. By abstraction from very different apparent physical things. And she says that energy exists in kinetic and potential forms, which exchange with one another as a body moves. It exchanges kinetic energy for potential energy as it rises. It exchanges potential energy for kinetic energy as it falls. Now, in Marx's case, he deduces the existence of abstract labour, which it, in places he calls it abstract human energy. And this appears in the exchange values of commodities. And commodity exchange is actually enabled by the conservation of value. And the conservation of value enforces properties on commodities. It enforces the value form. 
So, these two thinkers each develop conservation principles and they develop them by a similar process of abstraction. 